Just one verse to read to get started. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 32. Everybody understand, next week there's no church here. Next, and I know, I said, well, Pastor, but we are going to have church. It's going to be out in Ukraine. And I know that's a tough thing because we got to let go of this moment in order to build that moment. But I promise you the return is going to be amazing. So many people get saved and come to Jesus, and, and they live in this area. I did a wedding yesterday, and the folk were from this area, so they, they, they enjoyed the wedding. So hopefully they'll get, so we're going to keep doing weddings and funerals and doing what we do and believing God to fill up both places. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. You excited about next weekend? Amen. Come on, you got to be excited. It's about reaching people. Amen. All about reaching people. John chapter 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. I'm going to leave you seated for one verse. Amen. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. You know what I've been searching for over the last seven, eight months? Just truth. Just give me truth over about what's going on, all the things that are happening in the, in the world. Just truth. And the only truth I can find so far is 99.5% of those that get the flu uh, get over it. So I'll take that as truth. Can I get an amen? amen. So well, I'll just work on it. But you'll know the truth, and it'll set you free. Uh, we, we had this thing out at the ranch where we're, we're building this, this carport, and it looked like hurdles going into the church if we supported them. So I had this idea, and I had Joseph come up and find me a hurdle. Now, after church, I'm believing God was served for such anointing in this place that I'm going to set this in the middle of the aisle, and Valerie's going to start it, and y'all going to hurdle over this thing in the name of Jesus. Amen. And show just, just how good. You don't want me to start with Valerie? Maybe I'll start in the back of the room, huh? We, we'll have more jump. But, you know, I was thinking to myself, I, even in my best shape years, I couldn't jump over this hurdle. But my life and your life has been full of hurdles. Amen. Things to get over and move free from. You know, and there's one thing, and I want to talk to you about this idea, because we've had this, uh, I've watched, particularly in America right now, this victim mentality. It's a mentality. And it's moved among a whole groups of people. People that never knew they were victims all of a sudden are now victims. And everybody's crying victim. I'm a victim. I, I, I might not be my generation, but, but maybe daddy and grandpa and all the way back. And we go back and we got this. And it seeks in. Now, all of us at one time or another have probably been a victim of something. Okay? We, that's happened. But to have this mentality, for it to stick up in your head, that's a different thing. Because of the increase of evil in our time, when evil is called good and good is called evil... We live in an era where there are many victims of the satanic attack. And believe me, this thing is burped out of hell. It's Satan himself trying to cause this division, to cause our minds to think that we're always the victim. And it's caused us to be ineffective. And during this time where we see our legal systems unable to cope with riots and violence that runs rampant in our societies, the mass shootings, the targeting of our police officers, and now we as the citizens are being held hostage to this pandemic of this day, we can start feeling like a victim in our own home that somehow this thing is targeting us our legal system today is in such disarray and chaos that criminals murderers and others who are involved in violent crimes are going free they've been saying hey we're victims of this virus you got to let us out of jail listen if this mask works as good as it was supposed to work give them a mask while they're in jail i know nobody thought of that one all right we all face choices. We, we can become victims in our thinking by taking on this mentality or live in the misery of defeat and shame, or we can break free from this victim mentality and jump that hurdle. Can I get an amen? amen. This is Psalm 146, verse 7 says, Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. When I look at this scripture, I'm seeing people, when you've been oppressed, you can have this mentality of, of I'm always down. When, when I'm hungry, mentality. Prisoners, mentality. Blindness, mentality. All of these things. But he says the Lord lifts you up out of that. So my answer is to get back with God. Amen. Reconnect with him, and all of a sudden, he starts pulling me out. He starts blessing me. He gives me freedom from my past. Listen, as believers, we have no business investing in a victim mentality because God has delivered us from the, the, by the power of Jesus. He broke the bondage for us. We don't have to go back into being that again. It's almost like a beggarly 
uh, element that happens. It's like you've always got to have somebody yank you up and out of this. You know, here are some indications. You say, well, Pastor, do I, you think I got it? Well, you know, if you go to the doctor, they're going to check your symptoms out. Even last night, my wife took my temperature, you know. Uh, I, I just read where one, uh, this is kind of funny, this one um, a restaurant in Florida has a no-mask policy. What? You're talking about something that's just weird to hear right now. But if you come in their restaurant with a mask on, they kick you out. Oh, no, look at this outfit. Now, and the reason why is, as soon as the mask thing started, they got robbed. And they also serve liquor, and they can't tell how intoxicated you are with a mask on. <laughs> so what they do is, the truth that they understand is, if you got temperature, it's an indication that something's wrong, which is absolutely correct. So they check everybody's temperature when they come in. And if you ain't got no temperature, well, come on in. But if you put a mask on, we're going to kick you out. I thought, well, no, that's... That, that's so they, what they're doing is, is looking for symptoms. Everybody say symptoms. So when I think of symptoms, I look at the symptoms of those that are called into this mental. Well, they, they never get over this. They run into the hurdle and stop. They focus on the past. They concern themselves with how things should have been. They're preoccupied with problems. They are always blaming someone else for the way they are. This, this is that victim mentality. They find themselves helpless. They feel they have no control over anything. They feel like pawns in the game of life. They use the expression, if only, and what if. They feel like they are always being picked on. This is that mentality that gets, just hold that right there just a minute, Sister Cheryl. It, it just kind of freezes people. And as you can see, a person who is consumed with any of the above symptoms would have a hard time uh, walking in any sense of victory. This mentality does not bring victory. If you maintain it, amen, you will become a victim. And God has some better things for all of us. One of the great things I've learned about the gospel is when you know the truth, it makes you free. And all of a sudden, you're free from it. You, you know, oh, well, Pastor, you don't understand my past. I don't have to. But I believe you all can be overcomers. Amen. And God made us, the, gave us the ability to jump these hurdles. There are all these hurdles. Here, here's the thing. Here's one of the hurdles that stop us. And I know, I know, so, you, know I, you know what I like about this hurdle? It's adjustable. <laughs> God doesn't always give you the tall one first to jump over. He gave you the short one. Amen. And you, you live life little by little. Debbie, this was for you, you know, the little short ones. Amen. If, you, if you're vertically impaired, hallelujah, it'll help you out. But, but the neat thing about it to me is, is in life, it, life is little by little. Line upon line, precept upon precept, from glory to glory. That's, this is what's good. God told them in Deuteronomy, I'll give you the promised land, but I'm only going to give it to you little by little. Because if I give it all to you at one time, you can't handle it. Amen. If I started out, my daughter, she, bless her heart, she's a correctional officer up in Colorado. And she's trying to pass this uh, test so she can get in on, uh, you know, when prisoners act up, run in and beat them up. I think that's what it's called. I don't know exactly what it is. But, but she wants to be a part of this squad that rushes in there, you know, and, and that's kind of being mean, I know. Uh, but but she, she, she's got to be able to run a mile and a half at X amount of minutes. And she called me yesterday. She said, Dad, I got it down to one, you know, I'm, I'm a minute less, but I ain't going to make it unless. I said, when is it? She said, October. I said, Mandy, it's little by little. Run every day, and eventually you'll get your minutes down, and you'll be able. Life is about that. You don't, you don't lose 25, 30, 40 pounds overnight. If you do, you're sick. <laughs> or you had one mean operation. Hello. <laughs> Amen. So, so it starts out on the short side. You know, if I just got a step to get over, I can get over that. And then as life moves on, you'll realize hurdles can get a little taller. But first off, here's some hurdles to overcome. And you'll hear people say, well, I'm comfortable. Staying in the comfort zone is easier and less stressful than exerting effort to make needed changes. You know, and this is uh, probably one of the greatest uh, disruptions of American church is we're comfortable. We love comfort. Amen. We love, we love it easy. We, we name chairs Lazy Boy. Amen. We call people to sleep on couches potato couches. You know, it's just something about just being able to relax. We, we love comfort. We, we ate up with it. We like our vehicles to be comfortable. 
Amen. It just, we, it's, so because of that, we never jump the hurdle. We never get out. Hey, right now, people are watching me online. Some of them, they, they're not nervous about coming to church. It's just more comfortable. And I'm not picking on you. I'm glad you're watching me. Uh, sometimes it feels like I'm being mean toward those that are watching. But the bottom line is, a lot of folk will stay home. Because it's more comfortable to stay home and eat Cheetos and sit in a beanbag chair while you're listening to the preacher. Come on, can I get an amen? Second, I'm afraid of failure. I'm not going to jump because I'm afraid I'm going to fall. How many times have we seen somebody hurtling and they get their toe caught and next thing you know they fall? As a matter of fact, the only reason many of us would even watch a race with hurdles in it is to see somebody get their toe caught and to fall on their face. There's just something about the wide world of sports. Remember that? Amen. It's the agony of defeat. There's just something about, well, I don't watch NASCAR. Amen. But when I did watch NASCAR, NASCAR. I didn't watch it to watch guys run around uh, turning left for 500 miles. No, sir. I wanted to see somebody miss the hurdle. Uh huh. But many of us, we're afraid of failure. Fear of making a mistake or risking possible failure discourages many from trying anything new or different. So we locked into a mentality and we don't want to do anything because we're afraid. We'll talk more about that. Y you know I will. Amen. Next one, disproval. Disapproval hurts. The desire to avoid disapproval, either by themselves or others, limits many to a behavior that is calculated to please. So they, because they just, and I don't want to be, I don't want anybody to disprove of me, so they don't even try it. They don't even press out. They don't even try to jump the hurdle. I, I don't want to rock the boat. Amen. You know, if somebody sees me do that, it's like I'm rocking the boat because how many know if you have a dysfunction, it's good to hang out with dysfunctional people. Don't, you shouldn't hate man, Dad. You, you already know. Amen. But you know what I'm talking about. I, I don't have what it takes, Pastor. I, I, I've got these things in my life. I have a false sense of inferiority. I put myself down all the time. Uh, you, you do. Success may not be good for me. Now, this is one I don't hear a lot of people say. But, but it's true. Some people are scared of success. Because succeeding means if I succeed, if I succeed, then people quit helping me. If I succeed, then I won't get a, a check in because I went back to work. If I succeed, so they, they back off. And what if God doesn't want me to succeed? That's stupid. God even wants donkeys to succeed. I almost said something else. So how do you overcome the hurdle of the past? First, face the pain and deal with it. Everybody say, face the pain. Deal with it. See, I, I used to have a friend say it all the time. He said, if you can't get healed, just suffer. And I thought, man, what a theology. Huh? If you can't get healed, just suffer. Amen. If you're struggling through life, just come on through it. You've got to endure this thing. You've got to press through it. We must be willing to take a good hard look at ourselves and discern how much of a victim we have become and then be willing to see what it is that caused us to fall into this snare and then begin to deal with it. Deal with this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men. When he said pursue peace, what he said is, it's probably what got your hands hanging down, what got your knees in trouble, what got you dislocated is, you was hunting for hateful things. You weren't pursuing peace. So pursue peace. Amen. Holiness without which nobody's going to see the Lord. Look diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring it up again and uh, trouble you, and by this many be defiled. When I read this scripture about bitterness, I think about how bitterness infects us and we puke it out on everybody else you can't stay bitter by yourself you need help you need somebody else around you so you can be bitter if you've got a, a mentality that tells you you're always a victim you've got to share it with somebody come here let me share this with you I don't know are you about to oh. Amen. They'll call you. They'll text you. They email you. They, they want to FaceTime you. Amen. And share their bitterness. Amen. And because of that, there's no peace in their life. Their hands are hanging down. Their knees are weak. Uh, they've been dislocated, which means out of the place where God wants you. In this process of looking at our wound and pain, we may come to a conclusion that we have some major forgiveness. Amen. Some resentments to deal with. It has to be dealt with before the bondage can be broken. you got to deal with the unforgiveness. It's the first part of the process. When God forgives you, he immediately now tells us to forgive somebody else. Victims refuse to release. Victims refuse to release. 
They want to hang on. It's something they want to hang on to. They never get over the hurdle. Mark eleven twenty five. 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. You know, trespass, uh, I had to have my dad explain it to me when I was a kid. Because I, I, I would cut across Mr. Johnson's field and it would say, no trespassing. You know, and, and when you're a young kid, you don't understand what trespass. I thought no trespassing meant there's a big white Brahma bull out there. So, so trespass just means to go on somebody's property where you shouldn't. So no trespass. Don't, don't trespass against. Amen. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. What happens is this anger that's not dealt with properly, hurt that's not dealt with properly turns to anger, anger to bitterness, and bitterness to hatred, hatred to murder. And this is how this thing runs. For years I've said to you, well, I've called them the four A's. Anger always assassinates authority. Whenever I'm angry at someone, usually it's authorities over me, whether it be parents, employees, pastors, presidents, whoever, governors, mayors. When you get angry, anger always assassinates authority. It, it comes again. You know, sometimes your kids, they don't mean it, but you're the authority and they're mad. So they'll find out some way. When I say assassinate, I don't literally mean they're going to kill you, but they'll say things against you. They, they, they do things to uh, hurt you. It's, it's not normal for them to act that way. Once I have cleared up the bitterness and resentment, I got to focus on the solution and quit investing, amen, and focusing on the problem. The problem with most people is they spend all their time and energy focusing on this thing that's caused them to have a lockdown. Don't allow a perpetrator to live rent-free in your mind. Don't let a perpetrator, don't, don't let this thing just keep living in your mind. Take responsibility for your life. In order to maximize your, lo your life, you have to minimize your load. Overloaded people fail. Again, I have made it a point in my life when somebody says, I know you're busy, Pastor. What I say, Charlie? I ain't been busy in years. Amen. I, I, I'm doing more and I ain't been busy doing it, Dusty. I don't have to be busy because I've found so many other ways to be effective in life. One of them is, is to realize in, in, that there are people out there that want to help and make things lighter. Amen. They want to be a blessing to you. They, they've always, you know, when you've got this attitude of being overloaded, they fail in marriage, ministry, management. You fail at parenting, partnership, professional endeavors. It's like an airplane. We can only carry a certain amount of weight and luggage on that for it to fly. And most of us, we end up exceeding the weight limit. Motivated by desire to please, impress, or otherwise gain commendation, we take on too much. Even as we move toward this car show, I've lowered my expectations. I had to. We're six, we're six seven months from when we were supposed to do it. So I've lowered it. Because here's the deal, and I was explaining it to my daughter this week. Uh, um, false expectations leads to frustration. False expectations. He says good stuff. You ought to be writing all this down all the time. False expectations lead to frustration. Mike, you fly an airplane. Amen. They'll say, I'm going to take this plane up to 600 mile an hour at 3,000 feet. Well, you got one, one prop. <laughs> That's a false expectation. You're going to be frustrated when you realize it can't reach that speed. Or how about you ladies that you want to marry Fabio? <laughs> Amen. That's a false expectation. Because after you get married, you get frustrated because you realize you got Gomer Pyle. <laughs> you follow where I'm going? Amen. Same way in the church world. Sometimes we got these great expectations of what's going to happen. And they're false, man. You know, I meet pastors all the time. I'm just going to preach the word and the church is going to feel. And thousands are going to get saved. And it's going to happen. Listen, watch your expectation level. Amen. You, but you want to keep succeeding. You want to keep pressing on. But you want to get yourself in a place where you don't get overloaded. It's your responsibility. Everybody say, it's my responsibility. If I'm going to jump this, I can't jump this hurdle for you. you got to jump this hurdle. you got to get through this mindset and break it. No matter who or what you may have caused you to fall into it, it's your responsibility to get out of it. We've got to quit blaming. We've got to quit feeling sorry for ourselves. We've got to take responsibility. Nobody else can do that for you. You hit a certain place in life, now it's your time. The enemy wants you to react in life. The enemy's always after your reaction. He just wants to see you react. God's all about responding. The enemy's about reacting. When I tell the word react, you've heard of the emergency response team? If there's a hurricane that goes in, they show up, they get the power back on. Amen. If there's a fire, amen, they show up and put the fire. Emergency response team. Amen. But imagine if it was an emergency react team. 
reaction. So you call them up on the phone. Ah, my house is on fire. And they on the other end of the line goes, ah, your house is on fire. <laughs> huh? What did they just do? They reacted. They repeated what you done. And a lot of people love to be around reactionary people. They'll tell you something so you can repeat it back to them. Ah, oh, my life is a mess. Ah, oh, my life's a mess too. Sound like a contest. And they just react to your reaction, Bethany, over and over. But a response is so different. A, a woman of the widow of Nain comes through town. She has no husband. Her son is dead. She's weeping. She's crying. Everybody else is, re, 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 uh, is reacting to it. Ah, ah, the boy's dead. Ah, the boy's dead. Jesus gets over, lays hands on the kid. He pops up. What's he doing? He's responding. He's responding. When you see Jesus in Scripture, he responds. When, when you've got a problem, you call, you don't want a reaction. You want a response. Amen. You want somebody to help you through this. So in life, you've got to quit reacting to things and respond to it. The Scripture says that there was a woman called in the very act of adultery. They brought her in, the Pharisees did, and they said, the law says stoner. That's what the law said. Well, Jesus was the law. He understood the Bible. He understood Scripture. He wrote it, man. He was the Word. So he knew that if he takes stones and stone are fulfilling the law, they got him between the catch 22, living between a rock and a hard place. I mean, know what I'm talking about. Sometimes people will put you there. And Jesus knelt down and began to write, respond in the sand. I don't know what he wrote. No one really knows what he wrote. But whatever he wrote, they began to drop the rocks and walk away. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Amen. He responded to a woman that had an issue of blood. She touched him and was healed. He, he responds over and over. In life, you've got to be careful because I, I believe it's a trick of Satan. They're always trying to get us to react to things. Amen. We were, we were doing some concrete work out at the, at the ranch. And, and we had a situation where we had a form and poured concrete and it exploded. Man, I mean, it just whoo, all over me. And the, uh, the first thing that me and the guys in Charlie did, grab shovels and start shoveling. We didn't go, ah! Woo! If you stare at concrete long enough, it's hardened. Amen. So you better respond and not react. Amen. Get after it very quickly. You know, you, and drive, and drive it's the same way. When you're driving on the freeway, you can react or respond. Somebody cut you off, you can bump your brake or go ahead and hit them. You'll call. But I think response is important. Can I get an Amen. How about the prodigal son's testimony? Come into one senses, the scripture said. The prodigal son is a great example of a person who fell into the trap of a victim. You know, he wanted his father's stuff. He went out, he, 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 get, he, he used his money on riotous living, on prostitutes, and doing whatever he wanted, <clears throat> the scripture says. But his victory was predicated on the fact that he took responsibility for his actions. He decided at a time in a pig pen that after feeding those, he said that enough is enough. He didn't accept the fact that he was a victim. He said, my father's uh, servants are doing better than I am. I am a son of my daddy. I'm going home. He said, if, you know, and he could have had excuses. He could have said, well, you know what? Life would have been good if only this severe famine hadn't come. It's the pandemic's fault that I'm in this place that I'm in. You know, you can react or you can respond. When, when, when this thing hit, February, I was coming back from Colorado. I got the phone call. It's a weird deal. You get a phone call and it says, hey, pastor, they shutting the churches down. Everybody got a lockdown. They got to shut. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And so I'm driving. I mean, I couldn't even take a plane back from Colorado. I had to take the rental car. I'm on my way home. I remember like yesterday. I'm heading down 287, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what do we do? Just shut the church down and go online? How are we going to And then it hit me. We could get an FM transfer. Uh, transmitter and I could do like the old drive-ins. So instead of us just folding and saying, hey, let's not have church, we responded to the situation and had church again for seven weeks at a drive-in. Which, by the way, I think we ought to do it at least once a year. Amen. So we just need to have a drive-in. I just something about having it. Because I saw y'all bring your dogs and your popcorn and your coffee and your, and your pajamas hoodie. Amen. I think she came every Sunday for seven weeks in her pajamas. Uh, but, but it was something about it. We didn't just react. We responded. And if believers would respond, they wouldn't have this mentality of being a victim. Let me start closing here. The Scripture says in Luke 15, 17, But when he came to himself... 
And many of us, we just got to get come to ourselves. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. Humility is the position of strength. He humbled himself before his dad. He didn't bow up. He come running back to his dad. His dad met him. His dad didn't chase him. Parents, don't chase your prodigals. Don't chase them. Stay home. Pray for them. Amen. Let God bring them back home. That boy come back home, and when he got there, they killed the fatted calf. They had the party. You know the story, but he responded to come home. Uh, and the last point here, be, be, be kingdom focused. When I tell you I don't watch the news, it's not because I'm anti-media, but I am. Uh, I'm not real big into all the, I've never been in big into politics. I'm a very pro-life guy. So where, whoever's, vote, whoever's pro-life, I, that's where I'm at. As a part of my life in responding to the pro-life movement, God gave me three adopted kids. You know that. Which gave me my two grandkids. Which I wish I'd have got first. Right. Be kingdom focused. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added. When Jesus talks about all these things, He's talking about food. He's talking about water. He's talking about shelter. Friendship, relationship. All these things will be added. If I am to break free from the past, if I am to get over the hurdle, I have to begin to shift my focus on something much more important that will occupy my mind and thoughts. So I think about the kingdom. Next week is not about hot rods and Harleys. It's not about just barbecue. Next week is about casting the biggest net that we can cast and to win people to Jesus. Last night was not about gathering and eating out of a food truck. Last night was a concert, and the, and the guys would tell you, it was about trying to reach one person for Jesus. And I saw things, you know, I, I sat back and I just kind of observed. I said, God, you're so good. Amen. This is seeking first the kingdom. You know, in October, there'll be a, the uh, opportunity for a, a trunk retreat. And I've decided we're going to do it again here next uh, in October because it, it was so effective. I, I just want to do things that are reaching people and connecting for people. As we become more kingdom focused, we'll begin to make the right choices that enact the law of sowing and reaping. You can't be in the kingdom of God without sowing and reaping. When I do weddings, I remind the bride and the groom, this is about sowing and reaping. Sir, you cherish her. Ma'am, you respect him. It's sowing and reaping into one another's life. This week, and this is not boasting on me, but I had an opportunity to buy a vehicle. And I decided, well, you know what I want? I want a hot rod. I want 704 horses. I want something that'll smoke a Camaro and a Mustang. I want, I want. And God kind of humbled me and said, yeah, but your wife wants a convertible. <laughs> yeah. But she don't ride on the back of that Harley no more. And you got your Harley. So I compromised. Bought me a vehicle with a convertible top on it. Hard top. It don't look like a convertible. But there are times in life a, a compromise is a very good thing. Amen. Because it keeps peace and it brings. But it's, it's being kingdom minded. How, how can I do this? Our lives are made up of a series of choices. And if those choices were made according to carnal and selfish desires, we block the flow of God's blessing and abundance in our lives. On the other hand, if I'm making right choices that are in relationship to seeking first the kingdom of God. I'm going to release His flow of blessing and abundance into my life through the law of sowing and reaping. I have learned that is one of the most valuable. If I sow into this man's life, I reap back. If I sow into David and Tony and Joseph, I reap back. Sowing and reaping is more than just finances, my friend. It's learning how to re have relationship and being kingdom-minded. Think I watch Jesus. You know, some people read Jesus. I watch Jesus. When I'm reading my Bible, it's like I'm watching him, Keith. I'm watching him move through Scripture. I'm seeing what he's doing, how he's handling life. And what he's doing. The Scripture says, 2 Corinthians 9, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. I'm praying that everything you've... This is why you can't give up now. You've sold too much. You've invested too much. You've blessed others too much. Don't give up now. Amen. Because you keep sowing, I promise you, you're going to reap. 
It, all, it always comes back. You sowed those seeds. And his scripture said, look at that same scripture. Now, that he, God, who supplies seed to the sower. When's the last time you asked God for a raise? I'm not talking to you two. <laughs> When's the last time that you asked God for a raise? Listen, God can give you a raise without your employer giving you a raise. That's right. God can give you a raise without your parents giving you a raise. So he said, I give seed to the sower. But if you're not going to sow the seed, why would he give it to you? If you keep eating the seed. Every time I eat an apple, I spit out the seeds. You ever ate somebody, been around somebody, mm, would you save them seeds for me? I want them watermelon seeds when you're done. I want, I want, I want them seeds. You'd be like that guy that went to the hospital to visit that sweet little old lady. He sat there and looking at her while she's sleeping. She had a jar of peanuts there. And he said, I thought to himself, I'm, I'm a little hungry. So he reached in there and he got them unsalted peanuts and he began to eat them. He ate all them peanuts. He got about halfway through the jar. She woke up and looked over at him. He said, uh, hey, preacher, good to have you here. And he said, ma'am, he said, I, I just want to come pray over you. But I, I just had saw this peanuts here in this jar. I thought I'd go ahead and help myself. She said, that's all right. She said, see, the chocolate covered ones are over here. And all I do is suck the chocolate off of them and put them over here in this jar. <laughs> Don't be the one that just eats the seeds. Amen. How many want God to give seed to the sower? Amen. Then become a sower. Begin to sow. How do I hurdle the past, Pastor? Face the pain and deal with it. Deal with it. Take responsibility for your life. I can't change what happened. You know, I've gone through things. I, I know I have played the victim before. I could have. But, but when you own it, you say, you know what? That was my past, man. Yeah, I've had failures. I've messed up. But I've had successes too. I've jumped a few hurdles. You know, when, when your brother came to me, I was able to talk to him out of my past. Help him understand. Look, you can do this. Your, your church needs you, man. So find a place to meet. Take responsibility. Have clearly established goals and priorities. Get a plan. And then be kingdom focused. Life is too short to allow yourself to be the inmate in the prison of bad choices and weak decisions. The prison of previous mistakes and a victim mentality that comes with jailers of guilt and regret. Don't spend another night in the graveyard of guilt dealing with the corpses of your past. Don't you do it. No, no longer there anymore. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Yeah, you had a new starting line today. The gun's fixing to go off and the hurdles are ahead of you. This time, don't shy away. You're an overcomer. You're going to come over the mistakes of your past, the resentment, resentments and bitterness. You're going to clear that hurdle. And as you do, you're going to realize you are an overcomer. Natalia, you are an overcomer. When I thank you, and I've read testimony after testimony of what you guys have gone through in life, I see no longer a victim. When I'm no longer a victim, now I am a victor. I am victorious in Him because of Him. I stand in the, washed in the blood. The righteousness of God wraps around your dirty rags. He sees you through the lens of His Son. You now live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave His life for you. Quit acting like a victim. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. No more the victim. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now everybody look at me. Victors have a different vocabulary. They talk different. They talk about what God did and can do. They don't talk about what, what I should have done and could have done and would have done. They have a progressive mindset. They think different and talk. And once you start dealing with your tongue and talking different, victory starts coming your way. Amen. Things start happening. And you, got, you can't forget what you just prayed. God gives seed to the sower. Give me seed that I may sow in the lives of other people. Let me be somebody that is res responsible for the seed you put in my life. Amen? Come on, give God praise for His Word this morning.
times I wish I sat out there with y'all listening to me. All right, that don't sound arrogant, does it? But at times I wish I sat out there listening to me. Because I, uh, we've all played the victim. And we fall into it. And our nation's falling into it. There ain't enough people to help all the victims out there. You got to help yourself. You got to change the way you think. Amen. It's got to happen. There's a tithing offering envelope in your pew right now. I want you to reach for that. If you're given by.